Welcome to my podcast, Shaping Your Journey. My name is Aldo Matza, percussionist, drummer, and artistic director of Cosa Music, inviting you to listen in in conversations with friends, artists, professionals, and experts in the music world. Today, I have the great joy of having my great friend and longtime, um, how do you say that when, when you've known somebody for a long time? Um, well, whatever that word is, Rob is, is one of those. And I'm so happy he has the time to uh, have following his Chicago drum show. I had to take the time to join me on this. Thank you so much, Rob, for, for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Looking forward to it. But, but before, because uh, I know you've, you've done a lot of uh, writing books and, and historical things and, and things that are really important in our community, um, I wanted to ask you, what was the first thing that got you started? Drumming, music, you know, before you, you got into the rebeats and all of that, all of that business. Yeah, uh, it's probably the same kind of story you're going to hear 80 times when you interview the next 100 drummers. It's the excitement of drumming, the need to drum. I mean, I uh, probably some of my earliest memories were my my parents were big canners and bakers and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, homegrown vegetables, all that. Well, they would buy cherries in five-gallon cans. Well, that meant I had five-gallon cans and the lids for them to beat on when I was, you know, four or five, setting up a drum set and oatmeal boxes and, and all of that stuff. And, and all it takes for a kid that age who kind of has drumming deep down inside and hasn't realized it yet, and nobody around him has realized it yet, is a couple trips to a parade. And it, you see that over and over again. And, and one of the most notable ones that comes to mind is Ludwig Sr. Uh, talking about seeing, uh, uh, by torchlight, you know, a uh, American Legion parade and the thunder of the drums. And for for a little kid that is kind of going to be drawn to drums, nothing's going to bring it out like the thunder of a marching band going by and seeing all of those sticks flying through the air and the the, the feel of the percussion as it marches by. So uh, it, it was encouragement of parents uh, as I responded to that. Uh, that, that really helped an awful lot, but it, it it just came out when I was exposed to it. Uh, and so as soon as I had an opportunity to, to do it in an organized way or, or, or do it at home with, with gifts that started, you know, dribbling a little bit at a time. And uh, um, then the, again, the parents' patience was supplying a little bit of training. I was in a small town, so there wasn't much education readily available, but but that that was kind of the the impetus. I mean, you 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 show a kid a marching band or the excitement yeah. of a mar of a drum performance, and that kind of seals the deal. Yeah. <laughs> you meant you mentioned uh, Ludwig Senior, and I had I had the great pleasure of meeting him a number of times, of course, at the shows. But uh, because I'm a Ludwig endorser, you know, have been for years, so I, I got to hang out a little bit with him. But I invited him to COSA at the camps one year to give his famous presentation. And I, I, I invited him just because I, I, I wanted him to be there because he was kind of like the bridge. He was the guy who presented Ringo Starr with the drums, with the snare drum. You remember that whole thing? And I oh, thought yeah, that Dick was... Oh, um, yeah, Dick Shorey. Yeah. yeah. That, I, I mean, I thought that was the coolest yeah. thing. Well, and, and and, but actually, that was all junior. He, he didn't like the term junior, so he started in, in his, like, 70s using the term uh, the second. <laughs> but... Ah. But, okay. but William F. Ludwig Sr. that started the company with his brother Theo way back in the day, he was the one that uh, uh, talked about the American Legion band by Torchlight and everything. So it, it went back a couple generations. So it was already in William F. Ludwig II's blood. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, and a, was... in a deep way. Yeah. Yeah, and he was he was such a character, not a beautiful man, but a, a, oh, and a yeah. real character, rather really dedicated. Uh, yeah. Uh, and but what, what was really interesting is and now you brought me back to, to to that when he came to Cosa and he did his presentation on the silent movies 
you know, he had this whole thing he would do. And I thought, oh, that's brilliant. Most people have never seen physically what you do. So you can explain it from your point of view because you were, he grew up with that, right? So yeah. the interesting, the interesting thing that happened was when he was presenting this in one of our kind of uh, special classes that we did and everyone was there, Jim Chapin is sitting beside me and, and uh, Bill Ludwig said something in 1932 or, or so, something like this. And Jim Chapin being the other great character who was always on, on Cosa Faculty for years. So he felt really comfortable there. And he said, wait, Bill, Bill, no, no, you're, you're, you're full of it. Now, that was in 1934, you know, something like that. I don't know, <laughs> remember the specifics. And so we had this kind of going back and forth between Bill. He says, what would you know, you geezer? You, you know, they're going <laughs> like this. And we're going, everybody's going, and I could read everybody's minds. Oh, my God. I mean, it was like a, an argument, but a friendly argument on fact, you know, yeah. and they were so standing their own grounds. It was funny. So you'd see people going like this here and then here like this. <laughs> the funniest thing. I mean, we all had yeah. a great laugh, but that was talk about characters. You know, yeah. sorry, keep keep. I mean, it, it's great that these guys were so solid and so dedicated to what they were doing. That you just being just just being around them, you soaked up all of, all of this inspiration and information. That was funny. Yeah, yeah. After after that, um, I mean, did you go study music? Um, which way did you did you go? Yeah, not really. And in fact, uh, I I sent a an autographed copy of the Gretsch book a couple of years ago to a, a good friend, Dave Zerbe, who uh, went to Central Michigan University and was part of the Honer Percussion Ensemble and now is the director of bands at Alma College. And he has trained so many percussionists and he's, he's per started so many percussion ensembles and so on. And the the note I put in the book was Dave. Every time I see that the Alma College Percussion Ensemble perform, I have to wonder how different my life would have been if I would have had the kind of opportunities that you are giving these kids right now, because it just wasn't there. I mean, uh, I I was in a town of ten thousand in the middle of Michigan, and the band director was the only source of information. And you have to remember, this was, you know, in the 1950s, so there was there was no YouTube and TikTok and uh, right. no computers. Uh, I could get my hands on the occasional instruction book, and the the band directors did what they could. But I I did seek out a student. I figured there's got to be somebody at this college. It's it's a small uh, Presbyterian college, and uh, you know, a couple thousand students. And and a real good music program now, and even then it wasn't shabby. So I simply asked around until I was able to meet a drummer who actually, you know, uh, uh, played in the band and played in a jazz band on the side and did gigs and everything. And he wasn't really doing any teaching, but he agreed to give me some lessons. So I'd go to his dorm room and and I and I learned a little bit there. Um, Later on in, in high school, uh, when I had the, the capability to reach out a little bit further, uh, one of the most memorable trips was going with my parents to Chicago for an office supply convention. And my dad spotted the, uh, the name Frank's Drum Shop on a, uh, a letter board on the street and wanted to take me up to the drum shop. And I didn't want to go at first because I figured any store worth going into was going to have a fancy display window with a lot of drums and that this was going to be a dusty old office or something. <laughs> but uh, thank God that my dad kind of dragged me down the hall and said, look, we're going to go check it out. And and we got up there. And also, fortunately for me, my dad was a real people person like Maury LaShawn was. And yes. uh, I, at that time, actually had a drum set on order from the local furniture store in Alma. Uh, but Ludwig was way behind. The Beatles had popped. And I, I had a drum set. It was, a you know, a beat-up 
uh, hodgepodge and different brands and stuff. But I had my first real Ludwig drum set on order. But uh, since the Beatles had popped and Ludwig was way behind on shipping, uh, the, my drums had already been on order for you know like six months and no sign of them showing up. <laughs> so uh, long story longer, as uh, Dad within the first 10 minutes of being in the shop, he was able to meet Maury and uh, he introduced me to Maury and Maury, you know, put his hand on my shoulder and, and gave us a tour of the shop and told us what went on there. And, and it was obviously bewildering and overwhelming, but, and, and it, but it was worth it for Maury, uh, not only for what his mission and ministry was in percussion, but, uh, it's also a business and it paid off for him in that aspect because we, we, by the end of the day there, we bought a drum set. It wasn't the color I had on order, but I was able to convert my deposit back at the furniture store from the, the kit that never showed up over to a set of cases. And, and I was off and running and it, and it also started a relationship with Maury because I was in about 10th grade. And uh, of course, none of my friends that were interested in buying drums and cymbals uh, were going to Chicago with any frequency. Um, Maury was happy to send me stuff at 40% off and I would sell it to my friends at 20% off. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, I started my little uh, drum selling business in, in high school. And I was just so, so pleased and proud of myself that, uh, that I could call Frank's Drum Shop ask for Maury, he would take my call and be friendly and ask me about the weather and and I'd place an order for, you know, a dozen drum heads or two or three cymbals or something. And man, I thought it was pretty big stuff. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh no. And and Maury, I mean, you know my my relationship with, with Maury. Um I mean he was <clears throat> I mean he built that institution. I don't think he was the original owner of that shop, correct? Right, Frank Galt uh, started it, and and actually Frank uh, had uh, been working at uh, Dixie Music and uh, was working in the drum department there, along with uh, Ed Strait and a number of other uh, notables. John Noonan uh, was in the mix there, and uh, eventually there was a big fire at Dixie, and Frank Galt uh, started Frank's Drum Shop and. And that's where Maury cut his teeth. I mean, Maury was a gigging professional drummer, as was his brother, Henry. Henry was a violinist and had his own orchestra. Uh, but uh, Maury was a pretty big time drummer, uh, playing in Chez Paris and uh, the local Follies, a lot of Broadway. It's where he met Jan, his wife, who was yes. a dancer with those uh, big productions. Uh, so uh, all of these guys had big, uh, playing careers behind them, uh, but I, I certainly didn't. And uh, even though on one of those trips to Chicago, my dad begged me a lesson from from uh, Roy Knapp, so I, I got Ooh, that to brag nice. about. But uh, they tried to explain to my dad, well, no, it doesn't work like that. Roy Knapp has students study with him, and he has a bunch of uh, advanced students and players who uh teach and you have to audition so uh, if you're good enough uh you you can study with one of his instructors but the idea of actually studying or taking a lesson with Roy now is you had to be pretty darn good already and and demonstrate it but but again dad just kind of wheedled and uh explained that you know opportunities were slim in michigan and and uh and uh, Uncle Roy, as they called him then, and at that time he was teaching within the confines of Frank's, uh, and he he agreed to give me a lesson. So, I, and it, you know, he at least corrected some of my uh, stick handling. You know how I held the sticks and what I needed to start working on to get me started, uh, and it, and it was very kind of Maury and very kind of Roy to actually uh, accommodate me on that. But, but going forward, it was just listening to records and the band directors and, uh, and you know, I didn't really have an innate talent. It's obvious now at this stage. Um, I, I, I auditioned with uh, 
uh, groups for three years in college before I actually got an offer to with a band that was gigging for a summer. And I had to make a career choice at that point. And I, I knew I was never going to really make a, a full time living at it. So I had to uh, actually not even accept that offer that was given to me because I had an opportunity to go into the retail business. So I'm uh, I, I very much recognize my limitations in, in terms of the, the playing, but uh, it. it makes me feel all the more grateful that I've actually managed to carve out a, a career in the percussion industry and and know so many of these guys who do have that kind of talent. And... <laughs> yeah. But you know, you know, Rob, I, I don't believe in in coincidences. I mean, you know, how many great players do we do we need? We also need people who write about it. We do we need people who design instruments. We need everybody. So at some point you you know and we know. Uh you know, we, we received this information by some divine intervention. I'm not, I don't know, that tells us, and we know, we, we definitely know. And then you just put all your energies or most of your energies into that thing that you're, A, you're, you're more attracted to, and you're, you've been kind of, I wouldn't say chosen because that, that's too predestined. Uh, predest destined but I, which i don't believe yeah, in yeah. but i mean you make choices but you know there are certain things that speak to you certain things that you're really good at um and and that's that's where you go and then we all become part of that big puzzle that, and we're yeah. all so important yeah. right talk about it. and when you say speak to you that and i have said many times i i just managed to listen to voices that, that's i think one of my wife's phrases that i borrow and, and another one would be, uh, you know, when you see a door open, go ahead and walk through it and, and so on. Uh, you know, and, and some people are just plain a little reluctant to do that. I, I, one one that, that comes to mind is a good friend that uh, it was a customer when I had Cook's Music and he would drive down from the northern part of the state and make the trek with his bandmates. And I could tell he was serious. He ended up going away to school and was good in a percussion ensemble and i thought this kid's going to be in the industry he's got the enthusiasm he's got the basic talent and he's going to make something of himself well he, he got his uh, teaching degree and moved back up north to the a little town and was substitute teaching and he kept calling me every few months for advice on how to get into the industry and i kept telling him look, you've got to move to where the opportunities are. It, move to Nashville, and it's going to be grim for a little while. But I, I know that with your personality, there's going to be a place for you somewhere there. there there's, all, there's support for touring groups. There are touring groups themselves. There's small clubs, but it's where it's all happening. And if you get a call from there and you're up where you are, that you're not going to be able to answer the call. And he just wasn't sure about that. And then a year went by and he called and said that he had had an offer from Yamaha, who at that time had a pretty significant operation in Grand Rapids, Michigan, only two hours from where he was living. And they they were talking about an internship. And I, I said, you've got to grab it. That's, that's huge because even if you, uh, unless you're really terrible and, and slough off and mess up, you're going to have a job with them. And if you don't particularly want the job with Yamaha, it's going to put you shoulder to shoulder with so many other people that can open so many other doors. And you, you really need to jump on this. And he didn't do it. <laughs> so, oh, no. and, and the story went, goes on and he did eventually get into the industry but some people are just a little reluctant and i can certainly understand that and i see that with musicians all the time i'm in awe of musicians that just take every job uh, you know they'll play everywhere and anywhere for any amount of money because it's just what they do and and that opens up so many opportunities opportunities that they weren't necessarily looking for but they were it brought them to the right place so they were able to recognize it and a lot of them don't work out sadly you know there's a lot of musicians that are very talented have it that innate talent and just aren't in quite the right place at the right time 
for it to happen big, but but hey, you never know when the gold ring's going to show up. And Jan Lashan's uh, uh, catchphrase, I heard her say it many times, was, hey, shoot for the moon. You might hit a few stars along the way. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that one. I mean, I remember I mean, getting back to it. Now that you, you said it, I mentioned her again. I mean, she was such a beautiful lady. I mean, such nice people. Th those two were like my second parents. I, I mean, because yeah. I went to, I met them when I was at a, a music camp, a, tr a percussion camp, a Ludwig Percussion Symposium in Madison, uh, at the University in Madison, Wisconsin. And I had just, I, I was in a kind of a transi musical transition because I was a rock drummer and played with a, a band that was just taking off. And, and I mean, really taking off. They got signed to Capricorn Records in, in Atlanta. And this is in a little town in Ottawa in, in Canada. And But I was really itchy. I, I started to, to discover jazz. I started studying with a, a, a local percussionist. And my eyes, he had studied with Saul Goodman in, in New York. So I was like, uh, open to all of these new things and I started listening to records and I started going to everything that was uh, being performed in, in Ottawa from jazz to rock to pop to like anything <laughs> anything so I saw everybody for for a space in a space of three years I saw every single artist that ever performed in Ottawa from Weather Report the beginning to uh, you name it Bruce Cobra I mean um, all kinds of things but the thing is I had just uh, begun and I was at this path and I knew that I, I had to learn a lot. So when I came from this workshop, this not the workshop, but the, the camp, the Ludwig Percussion Symposium, I mean, here are Gary Burton, who was the first guy who showed me how to hold four mallets because I, I, I played a little bit, but not, but he sh everybody was playing two mallets at the time. So I learned right away four mallets. That, that was my introduction to mallets. <laughs> and then, <laughs> you know, you had, uh, I mean, Thomas, uh, what was his name? Another great vibe player. Uh, Carmine Apice was there. Lee Howard Stevens was there. I mean, all of these people, uh, Joe Morello, and, you know, they're trading fours and, you know, trading fours. I said, I only know about trading cards. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? So it really, it really opened the sky for me. And I was so, so enamored by this whole thing. And then uh, Jan and, and Maury had a little shop at, at the camp, right? And so we got really friendly with them. And, you know, you said it. They were just so nice, nice people and really... Uh, accommodating everything so they said before you leave why don't you pass by the shop and so I decided to stay a couple of days in Chicago so he and 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 J he and Jan took myself and I think there was one or two other people who were with me and we went out to dinner hung out at the shop and all of these great musicians coming in and out and of course the instruments in that place it was like it was like Disneyland of yeah. of I was just amazed what, you know, the revolving door, you know, take the elevator to a different floor and you've got different things. So I was just amazed. And then, and you know this story because you, you wrote the book, Franks for the Memories. And I went up to Maury and I said, Maury, before I leave, I really want to buy a set of Vibes, the M55, but I don't have the money. So he looks at me, he says, Aldo, take the Vibes, pay me when you can. And I went, okay. I said, you're serious? He said, absolutely. He says, I trust you. You're, you're going to, you're going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I, I couldn't believe it. I was so stunned by that whole thing. And so affected by that positively um, that I took the vibes tr and I rented a car, drove, drove to, <laughs> to, to Ottawa set up. And I told my mother, if anybody calls, I'm not back. And I was just started practicing and just learning all those things that I'd been uh, shown that week. And while I was there that week, Roy Knapp actually walked into one of the classes. So I met him briefly. So I got to know who he was. The, and he was such an institution. And then I, I continued my, of course, I, I, I sold my shoes. I did what I had to do to send more of the money. I just had to. Uh, keep the honor, <laughs> you know, I had to yeah. do the, just to show them that he, he did a really good thing and I could not have done it otherwise. 
Um, and and uh, boy, I would suggest that basically Maury was paying it forward, and and uh, it probably didn't come to mind at that moment when he said, "Hey," but he just knew it was the right thing to do to put that in your hands. And that happened with him years before. Uh, one of the stories he told me, uh, what what happened with Frank's for the memories, he had uh, called me, he had retired, he was in Florida, and he got it in his head that he wanted to do a memoir, and he wanted, this was in March or April of a year, and he wanted it out by pacing that fall. And he called me. I had written a, a history of Frank's uh, for Modern Drummer. Uh, mm -hmm. So we had stayed in contact over the years, and he knew I was interested in the, the history of the shop and so on. So he called me from Florida and said he wanted me to help him with this memoir. And I, I had published no books. I, I had no inclination to do it at that point. And I, I was kind of surprised by the call. But I flew to Florida immediately, took my camera, and and cassette recorder and everything. And we basically sat around in, in Jan and Maury's uh, uh, condo and looked at all the old pictures and and they just, uh, stream of consciousness told me all about their careers. And then I came home and tried to organize it in chronological fashion. But one of the stories when we were sitting there on the couch at Maury's was uh, when he was in the, uh, his playing days. And again, he was a pretty big time player. But uh, at the hangout was uh, Frank's drum shop and Frank called. And he was in there flipping through symbols and and tinging them and, and uh, checking them out one at a time. And he said there was one that just the lights came on. He said, you know, there's certain symbols that speak to you. And when you hear it, you know that's the sound you're looking for. And I always use the word the lights came on. But anyhow, this symbol... I think it was a 20, and he just had to have it. So he uh, flipped to the back of the stack of symbols and put it, it was stashing it clear at the back where he didn't think anybody else would, would come across it anytime soon because until he came up with the money to buy it. And Frank saw him doing that and came over and asked him what was going on. And he explained it. He said, this one does it. I've, I've got to have that symbol eventually, but... You know, I'll I'll get it when I have the money. And Frank insisted that he take it right then and <laughs> and well, pay I, him later. <laughs> I did not know that story. Okay. But, and, and he's and then he he said, and I still have that symbol today. And it, and I said, Oh my God. And he said, Do you want to hear it? So we we stopped the tape and we went out and dug through the, the carport and then he found the case and I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna hear the the magic symbol and this is going to be great and when he actually found it and he played it and he said see it wasn't my symbol and i you know if he would have handed it to me i would have taken it because it had belonged to him but i never would have played it it just didn't do it for me so i learned another lesson that day too <laughs> but it's always you know in your ears and it's the player and not the piece of equipment, the equipment obviously helps and is critical, but, but, uh, yeah, but anyhow, just kind of paying it forward. Another thought that came to me when you were telling your symposium story, a couple of thoughts. One is, uh, uh, anybody old enough to have gone to some of those symposiums, uh, you should check out the book by Carl Dustman, his memoir, because yes. I think Dick Shorey may have produced the first couple. Uh, but uh, most of them were done by uh, Carl. Yes. And and there's some interesting stories about everything that goes into producing an event like that, you know, <laughs> uh, that don't occur to you when, when you're a kid and you go. And I, I went to one or two of those, and I was just amazed. And it, and it didn't occur to me, hey, somebody's got to do all this work and, and provide transportation and rooms and yada yada for everything that makes this happen. I just knew that it was great to go and and sit there and and listen to Roy Haynes and see the whole Ludwig family walk in and sit in the front row and and so on. But when you were talking about the symposium, it it, it occurred to me that uh, geez, maybe that was the planting of the seeds for COSA because 
Now you're the one doing that kind of organizing and all the transportation, (laughs) the logistics, the instruments, (laughs) the artists, and and you're you're doing that job now. (laughs) I I tell you, Rob, and and, I, I mean, you saw that. I was clear. I mean, when I came back from that experience, I was I was just a changed person. Uh, then I got accepted to McGill, left town, left the band. Everybody thought I was crazy. Broke up with my girlfriend. I just um, I just became a total totally transformed uh, you know, with a rocket on. <laughs> you know, eight hours a day. I was yeah. just not the same. So when I moved to McGill to study, and, and all I mean, all of these things. Of course, I don't believe in coincidences. Things happen, and like you say, you you go through that door or that door, and something will always come up. As long as you show up, and it's always the the right thing. But people who don't move, well, well, of course, if if you don't do anything, well, if you do nothing, of course, nothing happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I and we don't want to inspire anybody to start doing reckless things uh, because hey. I, I kind of think this will work, blah, blah, blah. But, but you'll know if it's a real opportunity. I mean... <laughs> of course. Yeah, of course. And, you know, like they say in Star Wars, may the force be with you. But it's it's like if you're thinking, you, you, can, you can practically design according to what your personality, what, what works for you, what you have an appetite for. And and just be part of the solution all the time. I mean, that symposium really did it for me, huge. And and, and you see that. And yeah. then, of course, I went to summer camps of all kinds, whether they're marimba camps, uh, jazz camps, whether they're Jamie Ebersold, big st- stage band camps. I mean, anything that moved. And, and I, I became the busiest guy. And everybody used to sub for me because I was never there. I was at the camps. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah. I mean, it did it, years later, um, you know, I was I was very fortunate to meet the guys in repercussion at university and and do all my you know degrees and, and travel the world. with. And we still play together, by the way, with the group. Uh-huh. But the, the, the neat thing is that uh, one day when I met my wife, <laughs> this is funny, I was at a friend's house in, in Stowe, Vermont. And a very good friend, Peter Wilder, who's sitting there. And I had just met my de- uh, future wife at that point. And finally, you know, you know when, when it is, because there was this, those just stars around me. And, and, and no, everybody was keeping an eye on me because they knew I was not, you know, I was not that type. But they saw something happen to Aldo. Like he just, his eyes changed, his look changed. <laughs> they, see, they, they saw birds around me. I, you know, and it, and it was it was a great thing. So I sat there, and then I and I mentioned. I said, I said, listen, I've been I have this vision that I've always wanted to uh, to do, and now I'm ready for it. Now I've I've done so much. I've met so many great people. Worked with everybody from Celine Dion to James Brown to, I mean, with my group all over the world, recording TV shows. I mean, all of that. I said. I have, there's one thing I really need to do, and I think now is the time, is I want to design this camp. And it it needs to be like the ultimate experience. And it has to be in the mountains, uh, with a, uh, you know, in a college. And I was describing this whole thing, you know, with all the greatest artists in each category, a total percussion experience, because now I get it. And now I want to produce this because I I had it all in my head. And it was all, I, I saw it clearly. So he looked at me, he says, well, so I guess you've been up to uh, Johnson State College. Never heard of it. I said, you know, but the place has to have this you know, little lake over here and we can have uh, drum circles or, or, or classes outside, a beautiful theater, all of this. and has to be calm and all of that. So he says, get in the car, come with me. So 15 minutes away from, from his house, it was the college, wow. just near Stowe. As we drove through the up, get over this little hill and onto the campus, says, "So you've been here before?" I said, <laughs> "No, <laughs> wow. don't know what you're talking about." He says, "You described it. Look, there's the the little lake. There are the mountains. Here's the thing. I'll show you the theater." And I says, "Yes, this is it." Wow. <laughs> I says, "And oh now gosh. I can call." He says, "You're serious?" I says, "Absolutely." Says okay, I know the 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 music chair here, 
and let's go see him. So he called him. We, we went to his office, and we're sitting there, and the guy was just listening to me. His name was Andy. He's originally from the Bronx in New York, great jazz piano player. And he's just listening to me ramble on and on about this vision. And I said, you know, any chance that we can use this, this place? And he looked at me, he said, it's really strange because I was thinking about this this week. He said, I oh wish God. somebody would show up because I'm getting really lonely here because we have the, they're starting the music program, but in the 70s, apparently they had a huge uh, music program. It was amazing. But it's now they're slowly putting it together. But I miss missing, I miss playing with great people, having those people around. And I said, well, if if that works for you, I'll make it work. <laughs> I, said, got, I said, I know a lot of people and I'm sure they would back me up. And so he says, I can't believe it. Like you just showed up and you have the, and I says, well, I, it just came, it's been in my mind, this whole vision, I've got it all figured out. So then um, <laughs> the funny, the funny thing is Rob, that we had a good friend, uh, Steve Edelson. I don't know if you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was, we used to see him at the shows all the time. He, when he would sure. come to Montreal, he, I think he was with Paiste at the time. Um, the, when, yeah, when before, I knew that was him. before he went to Yamaha. Yes, yeah. that's right. That's right. The Yamaha, and then he, you know, then he floated around. But he yeah. was such a brilliant and such a nice man, and a great guy. And we had a really good relationship. We'd always have lunch when we met at Pasic, or or any of the shows. And when he came to Montreal, he would always call me between his because he'd do all those travels, right? Yeah. And we'd have lunch and catch up and all of that. So then my wife and I uh, at a I think it was in Nashville, the PASIC, when PASIC used to change cities. Yeah. Uh, we had lunch, and uh, I said, I really would like your opinion. Because then, you know, we were just asking people that I knew in the industry who were very well placed, who could be helpful, who could offer some advice, because I had never done this kind of thing. I've done, done other organizing things, and I certainly did a lot of. Uh, productions and involved on stage for, for years. And I said, Steve, what do you think? Um, you know, we just, we just got married. Uh, I really want to do this. Here's my idea. What do you think? And he looked at me and you remember the, you know, his famous smile, smirk. Yeah. He says, Aldo, you're out of your mind. <laughs> I said, Steve, what do you mean? He says, listen, you have a great career. You're going around the world. You're doing everything that anybody could ever want. And everybody's going to look at you differently now because now you're on the other side. And uh, you, you really have to know what you're doing because this is a lot of work. And not the, not the pleasant work that, that you're used to, like you're playing. And of course, you work hard, but... It's not. It's not the same. The business thing. Then, then you'll have all the, the the companies that you were endorsing. Now you have to work with everybody. I said, well, I personally have no problem with that. He says, no, you won't, but they might. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I said, okay. I never really thought of that, but I will. You know, I will be Switzerland. I I play what I play because I loved those instruments, and that should that will be clear. But I also, in this thing, we want to make sure that everybody's represented, all ideas are represented, just an open uh, idea that everybody is there in, 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 a, in intensive classes, day and night, the, the most incredible experience you could have. And he says, okay, I get it. He says, it, it, I think you're out of your mind. I said, but, but do... I know how you do things. You you do it like top shelf or nothing, because you don't know how to do anything else, any other way. In, in other words, he says, but this is this is an incredible idea you have, and really a, a, a challenge to to embark. But he says, then he said, but if anybody would be able to do it like that, you're the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, that's all I needed. <laughs> I, that's all I needed to be some some objectivity, somebody to to tell me, uh, kind of to endorse that from the back, just so that I'm 
I have somebody saying, you're crazy, but you can do this. You know, a little bit of encouragement coming yeah. from someone like that, who I respected tremendously. And then my wife and I, Yolanda, we said, yeah, this, that's, that's it. We're on. Yeah. <laughs> so then imagine we had up to 28 artists on site, like all the top people on the planet. And, and everybody from Mark Giuliano, who was a student at COSA. I, I mean, I can go on and on for years, but I, we wanted to be, to be the thing. You know, that's where the name comes from. Yeah. COSA, but yeah. we changed the K to a C, uh, the C to a K, just so that we, you have no other connotations, you know, an Italian yeah. Yeah. doing a COSA. La COSA. You know. so. I, I didn't know Steve, but... I kind of knew of him, so I feel I, I felt the loss when when he passed. It was a pretty tragic accident in L.A. It was, actually, it was a you know he was a pedestrian and got hit by a car. Yeah, between but, two cars. Um, yes. I just from knowing so many of the people that knew him really well, I felt like I knew him, and I'm sure eventually, you know, if we both stayed on the same trajectories we were on, I eventually I I know I would have been working with him in in one aspect or another and uh the the first time i think i heard the name was back to the franks for the memories thing when when maury got done with all of his personal story he said that he wanted the last uh a couple dozen pages of the book to be tributes to some of his really close friends from over the years and he thought it would be neat if they supplied a picture from back in the day when when Maury first got to know him and then maybe an inset smaller picture of them today and and just a couple words from them and i thought yeah that's a neat idea but the light didn't really go on until i was in the middle of contacting these people that what exactly Maury had done for me uh, he gave me this this long list of names and, and the contact information on who I should be contacting, yourself included, as you'll recall. <laughs> yes. He said, he said, uh, Aldo Maza, you'll have to, and I had never heard that name before either. But as I started contacting these people, I was just floored. I mean, there was Carmine and you know John Beck and Vic Firth and. Uh, Emil, Emil but, Richards and, and just yeah, Emil Richards and it started to dawn on me what a huge thing Maury had done for me and it, it, putting me in touch with all these people and in such a context I mean uh, I probably could have contacted all of those people on my own out of the blue and probably you know eight out of the ten not because they were too gruff or didn't have the personality would have would have brushed off the, the request. But as soon as they heard that I was contacting on behalf of Maury Lashan, it, they all listened. They all sent the photos and 80% of them said, this guy was like a father to me. <laughs> Carmine of peace, all these people yeah. writing to me. And I was still, you know, what was I, 20 at the time or 21? It opened so many doors and helped me feel like a part of that community. Like I actually knew all of these people as peers. And uh, that really jump started a lot of, of paths for me in the percussion industry. <laughs> as it should. And, you know, People like him, and, and I tell my own students the same thing. I, I said, you know, you you have two missions. One is to, of course, to be to better yourself and and to improve yourself and study with the right people and and get somewhere with this work hard. But then the other responsibility going with that is you have to be part. You have to be part of somebody else's success in some form. Mm -hmm. You must bring to the table always. And, you know, people like Maury was just that kind of person, him and his wife. I mean, they were a team. And when they showed up, would like the lights came on, <laughs> you know, yeah. and everything, everything they did was was good. And, and you know, I'll go back to um, at the at that time, I was actually a lot of people don't know this, but I was designing and building drums, custom drums. And 
you know, with these, um, I, I can't say too much now because I'm trying to bring this back. Uh, I won't do it myself, but I've all these inventions over the years, I'm getting them uh, out now, uh, patented, repatented, and coming out, uh, like Manhasset is coming out with a, a, a mallet instrument stand that I designed and, 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 uh, and patented, which is coming out at PASIC. Right. And this is amazing. It's it's a game changer, and and many other things that I did over the years, but at the time that was the first one. I got so deep in this that I was building drums, and I was so successful designing and building special sizes, special everything. And I used to get all my parts after that from Maury, you know, the the rims and the, the those things that I just couldn't have them fabricated, but the designs and the special things, the flips that I had for the for the heads at the time were all my my thing. But all these extra parts like the lugs, the those things. Maury was my supplier after a while. And you know, just like he he was for you, he really helped me that I didn't have to go and order ten thousand pieces of things. He would yeah. send me what I needed and I would do this and uh, until a point where I said this is too successful, but this is not what I want to do. So I put it all aside. I stopped. You know, I have had a whole brand, and, and some of these instruments are still floating. And and I said, I'll get back to this later. I, I really need to do this, like learn to play that. And if, if that, eventually I run out of steam and that doesn't work, I at least I can say I, I did it. I did my best <laughs> as far as it yeah. goes. Yeah. And I have other things I know I I can do and I do well. But but what I lived for was to play and to and then I, I love to teach, of course. I love to talk about it. And then I got into ethnomusicology and and then just my whole world just opened up, you know, because of all of this. And it continues. I mean, I, it, that hasn't stopped. Now yeah. I'm kind of bringing in these these other things that have been sitting in drawers. And, and and getting them out, but always inspiring, and you know you try you try to do that, and I th I think if if one cares enough, I think that's important, you know, as they did, mm -hmm. right? and then what you know this opportunity, like you call it opportunity, but that's those are things that people did, that people like that of that level, so much to share. Yeah. Um, to just make sure that everybody's okay. And if everybody's okay, you're going to be better. So, yeah. You know I mean? Then you contacted all those people. And then, of course, I got to know you. And then, I mean, the book was fabulous. I, <laughs> it was funny. Frank's for the Memories. What a great title. Yeah, and you know, Maury got that from a hot dog stand. I, he, he said, okay, I'm going to tell you the story, how I came up with the name. And I thought it was going to be it, it, nothing like it turned out to actually be, but he had literally been in a hot dog stand that, that had that name. And he, he thought, well, isn't that clever and everything. And so then a, a, the next year when he was working on this book project, he thought that came back to him and he thought, that'd be a good name for the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. But it was, it was beautiful because I mean, Frank's drum shop was the center of that whole drum community in Chicago and then who better to, to run it but Maury and Jan, who were just, just amazing people and all the people that they influenced and helped in, in their way later on. Yeah. And then, of course, yeah. you, you, you also, I mean, aside from doing the, the books on Slingerland, on uh, the history of, of all of this uh, drumming, uh, drums and, 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 and stuff, you also are doing the, the Chicago Drum Show and have been doing for years. Yep, yep. We're thirty years into that now, and it, it continues to, you know, surprise me. It's kind of like a living organism, and I, I, I kind of am the current caretaker, and I, and I'm sure it'll go on long after I'm gone because we have a, a, a pretty good uh, uh, pattern now. It's, it's a different group of exhibitors every year, but. At this point, uh, we just had our our thirty second show in in May, and there are a, few, a handful that have been of exhibitors that have been to almost every show, and a few attendees wow. that have been to every show. But of course, it's it's going to change. I mean, any you keep an event going for thirty years, and you're going to lose some people along the way 
I, I mean, literally, uh, that that have passed away and and are gone into other pursuits and so on. So they, they, there's always a very different group of of exhibitors, and uh, uh, of course, the uh, the pandemic shut things down altogether for a year, and and we lost some a, a couple of exhibitors that that. Uh, uh, died because of the, the disease and many others that were reluctant to come back uh, when we came back after a one year hiatus. Um, but it's it's pretty back, pretty much back to full stride now. I'd say uh, 2019 was a huge show, 2020 there was no show and uh, we had been planning on it. Everything was geared up. I mean, I'd spent a lot of money and, and had all the flights uh, for all the clinicians and yada, yada, advertising. And we had to pull the plug just weeks before the show. Um, so that was another hurdle to get over. But we did have a show in 2021 that uh, was our 30th show. And it was about 50% of the 2019 show, both in terms of the number of exhibitors and the, the, the general attendance. And then uh, the next show after that, uh, 2022 uh, was about 50% growth. And so 2023, we were back to about 80% of 2019. But, uh, just plain takes a while to recover from something like that with Ooh. with this kind of event. Oh and, yeah, yeah. And the and exhibitor I, list it looks quite similar still. We still have a lot of exhibitors that have been with us since the very beginning there, and only missed one or two shows. And and of course there were we've had dozens, if not hundreds, of exhibitors that only came for a show or two, or came for several, and then didn't come back for one reason or another. Uh, but I think we had probably 14 or 16 brand new exhibitors this year. Um, so it uh, it cycles through. You know, there's uh, different faces, a lot of the same faces. Uh, um, try to guide it along. You can't micromanage it too much, but uh, at least try to keep it healthy. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, and, and I think, I mean, what you're doing is you know, provides a huge opportunity. I, I remember when you invited me to, to perform there and give a clinics and, and workshops. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And it, but also what, what, what's really nice is it gets, gives us a chance to meet our, our colleagues like we do at COSA. Mm -hmm. When do you ever get to see, you know, like catch up with Greg Bizanet? Like he was there that same year. And, yeah. you know, when we invite all of these artists to COSA, uh, it's, it's not just the interaction between people who come to work with them or see them or see what the latest product or, or, or what's going on in the, in the community as far as the, the, the Chicago drum show, but also between ourselves. Then we yeah. say, hey, this, I've been thinking about this project. Let's do this. Let's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's many levels. You know, we yeah. saw a lot Anytime of time you can get somebody like Greg Bisonette or, uh, uh, gosh, I'm blanking on him some names. Uh, somebody with that kind of enthusiasm, that was a really memorable show that, that you were at, not only because you were there, but, but with Greg, he really lights up a room and he studied under Ron Fink. So, and Ron Fink was on my staff uh, for a number of years after he retired and was at that show. And <laughs> such a great group of people. Uh, I also that year, Dave Zerby, who I mentioned before at Alma College had contacted me and said that uh, he had some uh, money to place students in internships. So he gave me like four interns to help at that year's show. Nice, nice. And, and and one of my memories is of uh, Ron Fink uh, working with those kids on practice pads. Not that they were set up to do it or anything, but they had their pads out anyhow. And anytime there was an <laughs> idle minute, they were they had their pads out. Well, Ron Fink isn't going to stand back while some college kids are fiddling with pads without going over to see what they're doing and start giving them tips and everything. So, uh, and then uh, Greg comes down the steps about that time and starts uh, sharing rude jokes with Ron and and there's just hilarity. And I'm thinking, uh, I'm so proud and glad that I could 
bring this particular group together because look at the fun they're having. You know? <laughs> oh, oh yeah, you have no idea. I mean, how much fun it is from from that from that perspective, and you know, and and playing together and doing things. I mean, at Cosa, we would specifically uh, do that so that the opportunities were there to perform every night. We'd have performances and and showcase uh, a set of each artist, like would have 15 minute or 20 minute sets, so a full concert. So by the time the whole week went by, everybody performed with the rhythm section or invite anybody they wanted in their in their idea. And we got we got to do some really really interesting things. And and by the way, we filmed everything, so wow. you'll, you'll be wow. you'll be seeing some some of those because we digitized everything yeah. in the past and I three bet, years and i bet for from all of those those performances and uh relationships you could count on the fingers of one hand when there was a dispute that or maybe there weren't even any but can you imagine i've done a lot of production work i i did video at the local casino in central michigan i was the video director for 15 years so you see a lot of egos. I mean, it's a 3,000 seat room. So we, we didn't have the huge arena fillers, but uh, uh, a lot of groups from the past and so on, and a, and a lot of multi-group shows and among production staff and among musicians, there's a competition and you know who's going on first, who's gonna use what equipment. And you start to work with a lot of egos that are competing. Right. Yes. And I get the feeling having been at COSA that a lot of that kind of evaporates because they're not preening and competing for a spotlight and or money. They're there to perform, to work on their virtuosity and help others work on it. And yeah. yeah. And it, and it's huge, and the satisfaction that we all get on our levels, like, for example, the participant who's working with Jimmy Cobb, who has Neil Peart sitting in the room with them, and, and then we have these conversations and we're playing, or, or anybody. And, and then between us, we can we say, hey, I have an idea. When I'm playing, would you join me on this? Yes, absolutely. So there's there's no no negotiations. It says who who gets to it faster. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. No checking with the union or or demanding no, no, a contract. No. And <laughs> and here's here's a here's a funny one. There was there was one year when we had the steel band who was run by uh, uh, Jim Royal, and they were doing a tune from Michael Jackson. Which one was it? Beat it. Was it Beat It or... No, Billie Jean. That's right. They were doing Billie Jean as one of the tunes in, in their concert, in their segment, with, you know, 15 minutes. So you'd have four artists per evening. So he came up to me and says, Aldo, we're doing Billie Jean. And would you play drums on, on that? And I looked at him, Jim, thank you so much. I, I would love to. But why don't you ask Ndugu? <laughs> he was on the original... And then we we get to see what he played, and he says, "Do you think he would?" I said, "Are you kidding? He he would be honored, I'm sure." So he turned around, and Dugu happened to be there. He went to ask him, and Dugu said, oh, "Of course, I'd love to." Wow. So we get to see <laughs> Dugu play uh, the piece the way he played on the original, and of course, the thing swung like crazy. It yeah. looks like he was doing nothing, but I was watching him like a hawk. He was not doing nothing. It's like when Steve Gadd plays. He looks like he's not moving, but it's pure uh, groove, like oozing, uh, and the subtleties that are there. Amazing. It's a beautiful Yeah, isn't style. that remarkable? The fluidity of a, of a really talented drummer. I, the, the thing that always echoes in my mind is uh, when Buddy Rich was criticizing a drummer and he said he looks like he's got polio he looks like he's playing with polio and maybe <laughs> maybe a little inappropriate because that's a you know i don't want to sure, poke it of uh, course of course polio victims but uh we had a, so many drummers through the casino that when they're playing that came to my mind because they're stiff they're hitting where they're supposed to they've got their click in they're hitting the crash at the right spot but everything is stiff and then you get the next guy in 
and he's just so relaxed and fluid that oh, wow this guy's a drug i gotta meet this guy you know <laughs> yeah yeah but and also i mean to have i mean all of these great people around and and, and be able to not just be in a class but in a playing situation and the rhythm section has the opportunity and and people playing participants playing with a, a rhythm section that's like of that level and you're you're always like pushed off the cliff <laughs> to to do the <laughs> the most incredible thing and the most unobvious i i just had yeah. another uh, another a moment that was really really interesting when emil richards uh was was playing and in his set he he said aldo i'm going to play um some of the tunes that i played on like I Love Lucy, the Flintstones, because he played, wow. he was the <laughs> percussionist on all those shows, and, yeah. and then some, I mean, all his life. And, and Emil, Emilio Rodacchia, actually, because he spoke to me in Italian. Really? And he told yeah. me his real name. I said, well, Rodacchia, why didn't you keep it? Well, you know, it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the funny thing. He says, oh, I think I'm going to play that. Uh, I says, yeah, what, what, I mean, you, you play xylophone on the Flintstones, so I'll get the text to, to bring you the xylophone for your performance and all of that. He says, well, who should I ask for uh, to play drums? I, s I said, well, you have a choice. Uh, John Riley's there. Um, I mean, there were, Mike Clark was there. I said, you have a choice. But you know what would be really cool? I mean, that would be great that they play. Of course, that would be, that would be an, an amazing performance. But I think would be really cool, and, and the people in the audience... Uh, we also opened this up to the uh, uh, local community, the, con the evening concerts. I said the participants would be blown away because they would not expect it. And the people coming from the community wouldn't know what happened, wouldn't know the difference, probably, but our people would. Kenny Aronoff, he knows, he's known as the rock drummer, but he's a great, great big band player. I mean, he's also a great timpanist and mallet player, but... I said, ask him to play the Flintstones. <laughs> <laughs> and and at that at that time, we used to record the uh, the concerts, and we used to release a CD. We we have five CDs back back in the day, and we're we're still selling them on our site, just because there's these performances, Horacio with the Giovanni. Uh, I mean, all of these performances captivated so now we have emil richards playing from the flintstones with kenny aronoff playing drums <laughs> amazing i mean you know that's that's the kinds of opportunities that you have on the back end that other people enjoy but they don't understand what it means to us to be able to do that you wouldn't ever have to have the not even the time the opportunity the context but it's just great to, to be able to do that yeah wow so in the, I mean, you're, you're besides the the Chicago Drum Show, I, are you still publishing books? Oh yeah, and the yeah. stories. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I, I, um, some of them need to be redone, and Frank's is one of them. I just uh, recently, uh, I, I don't remember what inspired me to start looking into that, but I knew I still had a lot of those pictures. And I, I dug them all out, the whole, uh, all the files from when I had worked on the Franks for the Memories. <laughs> okay. And, and again, that, that was done before the days of scanning. And, and in fact, it was, uh, color was even prohibitive. So it was black and white. Yes. But I thought, man, these pictures, uh, should either go to a museum or to Michael, uh, Dubin. Uh, Maury's grandson. Yes, so I, I wrote to uh, Michael yes. and and said, "I'm I'm going to make high quality scans of all of these photos, everything in the in my uh, archives, and then I want to do something with these the the originals." And I we could arrange for I'm sure uh, PAS Museum or Dam or someone to take them uh, unless you'd like them, and I'll send them to you. And he he was very grateful and said, "Yeah, send them to me." So I, I did high quality scans of all of those uh, pictures and I'll, I'll be redoing Frank's for the memories eventually. And yeah, uh, it's... now I don't need to worry. There was a point in, in the publishing timeline, the, uh, the overall uh, timeline of what you can do and how much it costs with publishing 
when it, it just wouldn't have been possible. But anymore with print on demand and, and that sort of thing and uh, desktop publishing, uh, there's no big investment involved. All it takes is the time. So I already have all of the images rescanned, and I uh, will be redoing Franks for the Memories eventually. Um, I, I got an updated version of the Ludwig book out now, and uh, uh, doing a revision of the Rebeats Capskin Head book. That's almost ready now. I recently redid Drum Colors. So I uh, nice. hate kind of spinning my wheels. It, it drags down on new projects to have to keep redoing old projects. But uh, the Rogers book is down to its last couple of cases now, and there's kind of a resurgence of interest in Rogers and and some people that have been doing a lot of uh, research uh, beyond yeah. what I I did back in the day. Right. Um, so I'll be doing a, a revised Rogers book uh, uh, nice. before long. Before that, the next major project is a symbol book. Uh, it would be called the Rebeat Symbol Book, and I'm, I'm well into that. Uh, it'll, I, I won't be covering a lot of the same ground that Hugo Pinksterborn did in his wonderful book, The Symbol Book, but that was 30 years ago. So uh, there a lot of things have happened lot, in the symbol yes. world. <laughs> and, oh, and, yes. and we've gained a lot of insights into uh, things that, uh, that he did cover in terms of, uh, you know, Zildjian background and the uh, the litigation between Gretchen and Zildjian over the, the whole 20th century. So going to shine a light on all of that, nice. try to do some updating on the overall roster of symbol companies and symbol smiths, and then a whole big section on symbol smiths. So we've been focused on that at this year's Chicago Drum Show. Uh, I I kind of came up with eight of the top guys, and I invited them all to come to the show, and I thought we'd have a little round table. Well, Ooh. all eight accepted, and seven of them reserved spaces, uh, including two from the UK. Uh, so I had to reformat that whole plan, and we had all eight of them do uh, podcast appearances on the clinic stage with Steve Maxwell Jr., but it's an incredible movement. These guys have a burden for symbol making and for bronze. And the the thing that is a symbol is kind of an organic thing. I mean, bronze yeah. is an alloy that is kind of unstable. Eventually, every symbol will disintegrate. It's going to take thousands of years, but they change. The relationship between the copper and the tin changes at a molecular level. And these guys feel that and they know through trial and error, and it takes some of them five to 10 years to feel like they really have a handle on what they're doing with hammering. Mm -hmm. But I'm just in awe of those guys, like I am in awe of musicians that step out and have the talent and drive to make it. So that, that'll that be a big thrust of the symbol nice. book is nice. to really shine a light on how these guys do what they do and why they do it. Uh, one of the, the main guys in that whole group that signed on at the last minute it went because he was able to get a visa is Francisco Domini, a cymbalsmith from Brazil. And he's one of the only people that not only is cymbalsmithing and, and hammering and lathing and everything, but he's molding his own bronze. He has a foundry. And wow. this August, he's setting up a research facility in his factory in Brazil. So oh. I'm hoping before I finish the symbol book to be able to make a trip down because he is really excited of what I'm doing with uh, exploring this whole world of symbol Beautiful. smithing and what these guys are doing. And uh, he read the show program from the year before, which was kind of an outline of where I'm going with this whole project. And he was so excited about it that when he came to the show, he said, "You." He told me about his new research facility where he's going to be researching uh, the alloys and and how they're created and, and studying them in a lab. And he said, "You you have to come and visit me. My factory is yours." And everything. So I'm really looking forward to going down and and really 
seeing the secret sauce of how nice, the, the nice. things all start. So I'm, I'm real excited about that whole project. You know? Beautiful. And I mean, I, I'm glad you're doing that. Wow. You know, because there's so much we don't know that's interesting, and especially that topic. But yeah. I, I'm really happy to hear, though, honestly, that you're redoing the Franks to, uh, the Franks for the memories, because people would ask me, because I've shown the students, I've shown them my copy of the book. They said, oh, where can I get it? And it, it's difficult to get. So I'm really yeah. happy. Well, you're, uh... They can still get the old copy, but oh. what I had to do was scan my, my ex one of my last existing copies. So a lot of the photos that were already a little grainy are now even grainier but the text came through okay. But it is available on uh, through Ingram and and probably even uh, I think they distribute through Amazon and even at the Rebeats site, my own site, uh, the uh, the POD version of it. Okay. Um, that's another blessing of the whole print on demand thing. Is uh, some books that were in danger of going out of print, I was able to convert to a print on demand. So. Beautiful. Uh, they'll be there forever. I, in fact, I did that with several books that I did uh, with other people, like uh, um, uh, Ed Shaughnessy's book, Lucky Drummer. Uh, um, his uh, heirs were were amenable to uh, coming out with a POD edition and, and doing it on a royalty basis. So that keeps that book in print. Beautiful. And... Oh, gosh, what were the other? Oh, uh, Jerry Shirley, who was uh, the original drummer with the Humble Pie, uh, did, we published his best seat in the house, and it, it did well for a few years and then tapered off and uh, wasn't really worth a print run of, you know, a thousand copies again, but uh, print on demand saved it. So it's it's available still, Beautiful. or again, from... Uh, uh, Ingram and uh, these books are all listed at the Rebeats site. So I'm I'm happy that print on demand technology came along when it did because it was able to keep some books that are that otherwise would have been dead, uh, yeah. except for whatever copies you could scrounge out. But they're yeah. they're still available. Well, that's fantastic. I'm I'm really happy you're doing this. Um, can't sit on your hands and don't please don't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I mean, I, I was when you called me and you said I want to come to Cuba to your program in Cuba. I, I mean, I want to tell you, Rob, I was that was an honor having you with us. That was fun. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yep. That that was great. Maria and I are still talking about that, and uh, now she's excited about uh, coming to Calabria. Uh, oh, that's that's yes. her kind of trip, and it's on our bucket list. So yeah. We'll be talking to you about that. <laughs> Yay. And I won't, let's not talk about the food. Just. Yeah. <laughs> <please. laughs> yeah. Anyway. But yeah. anyway, I, I, I do want to thank you for um, taking the time to do that. And we can go on for oh, hours yeah. about all of yeah. these uh, things and things that I didn't know you were working on. So I, I'm really happy to have learned something today. Um, and Maury's story about his, his own personal journey trajectory, which, of course, these things influence us and influences the way we do things. And, you know, we, we make such a big difference in, in, in people's lives. Sometimes we don't realize it. But I think if you just stay on your track and you do what you do well and be, you know, what I tell people is, is what's important is the, the intention. You know, what is the intention? If the intention is a good one, is an honorable one, you cannot go wrong. Yeah. And, yeah. and and that yeah. always wins and, and you're happier all the time. <laughs> no matter all the whatever you have to deal with, it's part of the part of the when when it rains, well you get wet. But Yeah, yeah, it's life. Uh there's the, it it rains, yes. you're gonna get wet, but yeah, keep going. <laughs> That's right. But the, the intention and, and understanding how important it is to make people feel good, to feel well, to feel welcomed and, and give, you know, giving is, is always yeah. such a such a, a bigger joy than receiving. Uh, yeah. And people have no idea the impact that 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 you know, one has when they do that. I mean, we all have experienced that. And when it's that big, it, it changes us for life in a good way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
And I think, sure. and you're one of those people, Rob. <laughs> oh, pal, thank you. It's an honor. <laughs> and and as, as I always say, to be continued.